Hey, what's up, everyone? Dr. Zishan here. Um, I really want to take a moment to thank everyone that listens to our podcast, um, that subscribes to the podcast, that even shares it amongst other people and your peers. Thank you so much from uh, myself and the team at NCLEX High Yield. Uh, it's because of the audience that we have, the people that follow us on here, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok that really keeps us going and motivated to keep bringing you some new content as often as we can. Remember, we do have our free weekly Zoom every single Wednesday that we do a new topic, practice questions as well to try to come to that free weekly Zoom, free education, why not? And then also right after that, we start doing trivia. It helps the neurons fire. So on, on test day, you get that um, association real quick. You're not wasting a lot of that brain power. And lastly, remember, we always have the on-demand going. If you like the podcast, if you like our YouTube channel, imagine having 70 hours of content with notes, with myself lecturing on pretty much every topic and seeing all these people get 85 and out. So again, thank you all so much and um, good luck. All right, so let's talk about Cardio Farm. Cardio Farm is arguably the highest yield subject when it comes to farm because we have so many different topics that happen with cardio, i.e. coronary artery disease, hypertension, we've got uh, beta blockers, we've got ACE inhibitors, we've got nitrates, we've got statins. We've got so many different drugs that pop up under cardio farm that I want to address them in a podcast. And the first one we're going to start with is we're going to start with ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors end in pril, P-R-I-L, so things like captopril, lisinopril, enalapril. The mnemonic that we want to know is ACE-I. And with FARM, again, identifying the drug is very important. In this situation, we identified this drug as an ACE inhibitor, knowing that it ends in P-R-I-L, pril. The second thing we want to know with FARM questions is we want to be able to identify the side effect, which is where that mnemonic I just talked about, ACE-I, comes in. And the mnemonic is A for angioedema, C for cough, E for excess potassium, and then the I for instead, we can use ARBs. Let me elaborate on each one of these side effects. The first one is angioedema. Angioedema actually becomes ask graph. Angioedema is, in fact, the swelling of the lips, swelling of the mouth, swelling of the tongue. And in this situation, we are scared that this is, in fact, airway, airway, airway. The second thing is we've got cough. Now, this cough is not airway. It is a nagging cough, maybe even a nighttime cough, a dry cough, a hacking cough, whatever they say. It is a side effect, but it's not airway. But it is something that we want to, with angioedema and with cough, we want to instead, the I in ACE I, instead use an ARB, an ARBs and in Sartan, and we'll get into that here in a little bit. The E is excess potassium. But why does it have excess potassium? Well, let's think about this. It's an ACE inhibitor. So what does that mean? Well, it's an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor. Now I'm gonna make this really, really boring and excruciatingly painful because I'm gonna talk about the RAAS, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Well, of the three topics that I just talked about, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone, in this system, the one I'm worried about is aldosterone. Aldosterone is responsible for sodium. Sodium goes up, water follows it. So if I take a step back into the angiotensin and I inhibit the conversion of it, i.e. the ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, I'm not going to make aldosterone. I don't make or I decrease making aldosterone, I decrease sodium, and I decrease water following it. So I get rid of sodium, I get rid of water, which means I decrease blood pressure. 
But if sodium goes down, there's an inverse pump. That sodium-potassium pump means sodium goes down, potassium goes up. So this is why we have that excess potassium. And then again, instead, for angioedema and for cough, we use ARBs. ARBs and in Sartan, Valsartan, Losartan, these are angiotensin receptor blockers. Angiotensin receptor blockers or ARBs. Again, in this situation, I'm knocking out angiotensin. If I knock out angiotensin, I knock out or decrease the production of aldosterone. If I decrease the production of aldosterone, I decrease sodium, I decrease the water that follows it, and I decrease blood pressure. In return, since sodium goes down, well, guess what? Potassium goes up. As potassium goes up, we can't swap out an ACE inhibitor for an ARB when both have excess potassium. So that's why only angioedema and cough are going to be the reasons why we switch from an ACE inhibitor to an ARB. But both cause excess potassium. So if we have excess potassium, we're going to scrap both drugs and we're going to find something else for blood pressure. The other thing about both these drugs is that they're both teratogens. Both of these are going to be unsafe in pregnancy, which leads me to your quick tip. Hypertensive mothers love nifedipine. This mnemonic is going to help you remember the drugs that are safe in pregnancy. Hypertensive, hydralazine, mothers, methyl dopa, love, labetalol, nifedipine is nifedipine. So these are two super high yield drugs. We've got ACE inhibitors. We've got ARBs. We talked a little bit about the RAAS. The side effects, which are super important, the contraindications with pregnancy, and we can go to alternatives if we can't use any of them in excess potassium because both cause that. If both of them are teratogens, we must switch them out. So in the next section, we'll talk about drugs that are safe in pregnancy or that can be used as alternatives in the case that we have excess potassium. So as we talked about ACE inhibitors and ARBs both being teratogens, I wanted to actually touch on the drugs or the, at least the most popular drugs that you're going to see potentially on your board exams that are in fact teratogens. The mnemonic is teratowa, T-E-R-A-T-O, W A Torado Wa. The first T stands for thalidomide. Thalidomide was an anti cancer drug that was approved back in the late 90s and had a direct effect on the fetus and was in fact labeled as a teratogen because of the impact that it had on the fetus. But Ultimately, this is not a popular drug that we see in real life, but for the sake of the boards, it is something that we should be able to identify as a teratogen. The E in teratowa is epileptic drugs. Things like valproic acid, things like phenytoin, which we'll get into uh, in another section when we do a little neuro drugs. The R in teratowa is retinoid. Retinoid meaning vitamin A. Vitamin A being used for acne, so things like retina, um, retina A, retinoid. With retinoid or vitamin A, we're concerned about this being a teratogen, and I think this is one of those ones that we have to pay attention to because I say this all the time. If in your answer choices during your exam, you see when was the last menstrual cycle, do a urine pregnancy test, do an HCG. If you see any of these in your answer choices or are they sexually active, take a step back on that question and ask yourself, why did they put this into the answer choice? Because chances are it's there for a reason. Now, it's not always going to be the right answer, but at least it makes you think, hey, why did they put that in there? Because that's not a common answer choice. 
So again, if you think about a young female patient or a sexually active female patient, we're concerned about them being on potentially retinoid or vitamin A derivative, which helps with acne, but is in fact a teratogen. The A is what we just talked about. We talked about ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So that's what brought me to teratoa. The second T in teratoa is third element. So if you think about the, that chakra that's in the middle of your head, you think about the third element and the third element being a mood stabilizer like lithium. So a little bit of a stretch there with this mnemonic, but if you think about third element, you think about the chakra in the middle of your head, you think about your mood, you think about mood stabilizer, and hopefully it brings you to lithium. The O is oral contraceptives. So again, we're concerned about any type of OCPs being a teratogen, the W being warfarin, and the A in teratoa being alcohol. So again, teratoa is a great mnemonic to help you remember the more commonly tested teratogens that may show up on your boards. So moving on to other types of um, antihypertensive drugs. So we talked about our ACE inhibitors, we talked about our ARBs. Now let's talk about an alternative that we can use, in fact, for hypertension, which is our calcium channel blockers. For calcium channel blockers, there are two different classes. I'm going to focus on one for hypertension, and that is what's called our dihydropyridines. Now I don't really need you to know that term, but these are the ones that end in dipene. So again, that suffix or identification of farm drugs with calcium channel blockers, look for the drugs that end in dipene. Things like amlodipine, nicardipine, nifedipine, nimodipine. These all end in that D-I-P-I-N-E, and these are our dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. They're a great alternative for hypertension. Not only can we use these drugs for hypertension, but as we go through some of the lectures that I've taught, we can in fact use this drug for angina. Because of the fact that this can vasodilate, meaning it makes our vessels dilated, it opens up those vessels in the coronary arteries. So as we use calcium channel blockers to open up those vessels in the coronaries, as we use calcium channel blockers to vasodilate, especially in the coronary arteries, because we have that atherosclerosis leading to angina or that chest pain, we now are allowing that blood flow to get to that portion of the heart that is not getting it, causing that chest pain. So the purpose of calcium channel blockers is to vasodilate, but wait a minute. Calcium channel blockers are not gonna just work on one vessel. They're not gonna work just on the coronary arteries. They're gonna work systemically, which means I'm vasodilating throughout the entire body. If I vasodilate throughout the entire body, just think about the room I'm making in different vessels in the periphery, which means I've now created the ability for blood to flow with gravity into that space I've created in my periphery, which means if I stand up, can I potentially get a syncopal episode or have orthostatic hypotension? So we must educate our patients to change positions slowly because the last thing we want is for them to stand up, fall down, hit their head, and now they're dead. So educate them to change positions slowly because again, we are vasodilating, creating blood or creating room for blood to pool into our lower extremities, which means if over the course of time, I've got a patient that's on amlodipine or nicardipine or nifedipine, and they're taking it for a long period of time, they're chronically taking this medication and I've created room in the periphery for blood to pool, have I not just created peripheral edema? I have. So educate them on the peripheral edema. Make sure that they're wearing compression stockings. Make sure they're elevating their legs, not allowing that blood to pool. So some takeaways with um, calcium channel blockers. Again, we're talking about the dihydropyridines. 
they end in depene. They are potent vasodilators. They're going to work systemically. So they'll help with that hypertension. But not only that, they're going to help with angina. More importantly, they'll create room in the coronary arteries for that blood to flow. But in the periphery, they do the same thing. They create room for blood to flow, which means that we can get that orthostatic hypotension. We can get that peripheral edema. So those are our dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. All right, another super high yield cardio drug is amiodarone. So before I get into amiodarone, I do want to point out that the boards love confusing three different drugs that all start with A that are all cardio drugs. The first one being amiodarone, which is what we're going to get into. The next one is adenosine and atropine. So amiodarone, we're about to get into, and then adenosine and atropine, they're going to try to confuse you about. So with amiodarone, we've got to worry about what we use it for. So identifying amiodarone first and foremost, what do we use it for? Well, we use it for atrial fibrillation, atrial flutter, and for ventricular tachycardia. So these dysrhythmias that we talk about in EKG lecture ultimately may have the use for amiodarone. If we're using amiodarone, we must know the side effects because the side effects for amiodarone are nasty. And the way to remember them is simple. PFTs, TFTs, and LFTs. What does that mean? PFTs, pulmonary function test. This drug can cause pulmonary fibrosis. Now let's think about this. I talk about fibrosis in general. Fibrosis, the scarring of tissue, the fibrosing of tissue is irreversible. Think about any scar that you've ever gotten or you've ever witnessed or you've ever seen. Does it ever go backwards? It doesn't. So anytime we have a drug that can, do, that can cause pulmonary fibrosis in the lungs, is gonna to lead to an irreversible restrictive lung disease. I'm fibrosing the lung because of this drug and I'm on this drug for long periods of time, I'm going to end up causing irreversible damage to my lungs. So how is this gonna present? Well, how about a patient that presents with shortness of breath that has been on amiodarone? Yeah. How about the patient that was recently started on amiodarone that can't walk from the bedroom to the kitchen? without getting short of breath, or their O2 sats are now 90%. That's not normal. This becomes ask graph. It becomes airway, airway, airway. So what do we do? We stop the offending agent because ultimately, we do not want to cause pulmonary fibrosis because it is irreversible. The TFTs is a thyroid function test. This drug is not gonna, this drug is also gonna mess with the thyroid which means that if I'm started on amiodarone and it's going to mess with the thyroid, then I'm looking at the first sign and symptom of hypothyroidism, which is what? It's not weight gain. It's, it's not cold intolerance. It's in fact fatigue. They're going to say, I'm tired. So now we're going to do a workup. We're going to look at their thyroid function test, get a free T3, a free T4, and a TSH. Then... We're also concerned about their LFTs, their liver function test. This drug is severely hepatotoxic. So again, we don't want to take a drug that's going to lead to hepatotoxicity because again, we can lead to fibrosing or scarring of the liver. And if we're on it for a long time, that is in fact cirrhosis. And we get into depth with the problems of cirrhosis with the ABCs of cirrhosis when we have scarring or fibrosing of the liver. So now we're gonna check their ALT and their AST. So amiodarone being a nasty drug that the boards would love to test because the side effects are so significant, used again in atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia. Remember your PFTs, your LFTs, and your TFTs, your pulmonary function test, your liver function test, and your thyroid function test.